We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. It's Mother Nature, it's a beast. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people. Cheers, mate. Ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the Pedro goes, it's that adrenaline rush every single time. You could make the difference between life and death. I feel very lucky. Then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. OK. Equipped with their own cameras. Just the two of you. Come on, yes. The crews give us a unique insight into every call-out. Nice deep breaths, OK? All right. As only they see it. The ambulance is here, OK? For those who risk their lives, yeah. it has become a way of life. Come on! Bringing loved ones home. OK. There's really no better feeling in the world. coast of Kent in southeast England is the popular resort town of Margate. Margate's a lovely seaside town. I have not lived in a place that's friendlier than Margate. It's a really, really lovely town to live in. Great community. In the summer, you've got people coming down from all over the place. When they're all down and on the beaches, you can see the families being really, really happy, getting ice creams, just general happiness around Margate. There's been a lifeboat in Margate since 1857, and today's crew are a tight-knit group. Yeah, I was thinking, oh, well, I'll, I'll take it if I have to, but please, please turn up, Chris. <laughs> you are. The crew are made up from people from totally different backgrounds. People have got their strengths and weaknesses. One of your jobs as a helm is to sort of look at the job that you're going out to and sort of think, OK, who are going to be my best crew to take? Chris has been on the crew for eight years and his nautical interests aren't limited to the lifeboats. I've been described as a shipster, which I guess is a, uh, uh, a hipster of the sea. I'm off to see my darling Jen, she's been hanging round the I'm in a sea shanty band called the Snottle Dogs. I think it's safe to say that we are Margate's premier sea shanty band. I mean, we might be Margate's only sea shanty band, but <laughs> that's, that's fine, I think. Uh, we're going to sing a song now about uh, the lifeboat. While Chris may be Margate's premier shanty band singer. He definitely gets the crowd going when he's performing. Not all lifeboat crew members are obliged to join in for a maritime sing-song these days. When they come on, they'll go and stand somewhere else. It's just not my cup of tea. A bit of prodigy or something like that is me. Early August. A warm, sunny day with winds gusting up to 20 miles an hour. The Coast Guard receives a number of 999 calls from Kingsgate Bay, two and a half miles southeast of the lifeboat station. I was actually on the beach with my family, having a nice time. Then my pager started to ring and I saw my wife's face drop. It's reported that three paddleboarders are being swept out to sea by the strong winds and the outgoing tide. So the information that we got was that it was two adults, one child, on a paddleboard 300 metres off of Kingsgate Bay. And three people on one paddleboard is not ideal. So it was a bit of a hurry-up job. To make matters worse, in the last few hours, the winds have increased and shifted direction. They're now blowing offshore. It was a southerly breeze, probably about a force three. The further out you go, the more you're going to be feeling the effects of that. Oh. All right. We'll go down one, OK? Yeah. 
so it can get really, really hairy and really horrid out there. Did they say what colour the board was? The fish that it was facing, we don't know how long they've been in the water. Can they swim? They could end up drifting further out from where they were last seen. The casualties were last seen on a paddleboard roughly 300 metres off Kingsgate Bay, one of six bays on this stretch of the headland. That's John's bay, it is, isn't it? That's Portney Bay. When we arrive at the last known position, there was nothing to be seen, so it starts running for your head. Where have they gone? Are we now looking for people in the water? Definitely adds a lot of pressure to the situation when you know there's a child. I'm a father and, you know, you can't help but start to think, oh, God, that could be my child. Those thoughts and emotions start to sort of run through your head. The call to the Coast Guard was made by the mother of the child on the paddleboard. As they started drifting further and further out, my anxiety level started to increase. I did feel pretty helpless and increasingly concerned, particularly when I thought, what if one of them would come off the board? You know, the water is cold, the conditions had got much worse at that point, so I was, I was pretty frightened for them. That's a boy. We could feel the offshore breeze picking up. We could tell that the casualty we were looking for was probably being swept out. Back on the beach, Sarah has now almost completely lost sight of her 12-year-old son, Charlie, and her husband, James. We could see that there were some quite large ships and beyond that was the offshore wind farm. So that felt really scary. I can imagine in that environment that, that the waves would be really high. They would be so far from the beach, they might not be able to see us. And that must be really overwhelming and frightening, particularly for a child. So I was, I was really worried. As the crew scan these waters for any sign of the paddle boarders, an update comes in over the radio from an RNLI lifeguard who's paddled out on a rescue board to assist the search. It definitely ups the ante when potentially a sighting of them towards where the, the anchored ships are. That is a bit worrying because that's a long way out. That's more than 300 metres. That's like a mile and a half. Yeah. The position that the lifeguard is reporting is right next to the busy shipping lanes, nearly two miles out to sea. Trying to spot a person in the sea is incredibly difficult. A head is the size of, you know, a football floating around. And your eyes can start to play tricks on you as well. Looking out that way, there wasn't anything obvious that we could see in that area. Time seemed to slow down. There was a, a point at which I thought, actually, something could be really wrong here. You know, why is it taking so long? You know, they might not find them and not being able to see them just compounded that feeling, really, of, of helplessness. Something in between them two boats. You see it? Yeah. Finally, Pete catches a glimpse of something nearly a mile further out. When I first spotted them, they were like a speck on the horizon, like a small dark object just bobbing away. Now, can only see two. Equally concerning is that there aren't three casualties with the paddleboard. The moment that we realise that there's only two people there, then your heart starts to sink a little bit. You know, you're like, oh, where's the, where's the third person? Panic starts setting. Are we now going to start searching for a person in the water? So, Coast Guard, so, Coast Guard, this is Margate the Coast Guard. I found out from the casualty that it wasn't a third person, which was a massive relief. They were scared and cold. Hello, what's your name? Charlie, how you doing, mate? 
the young boy, I think Charlie was his name. He was really pleased to see us, so we got him onto the boat, got his dad on. But they assured us that there was only the two of them, so we just assumed that must have been some misinformation. So, sorry, guys, thank no you. No worries, right. no worries. OK, let's get pop that round your waist there. And do your... You could definitely see in the dad's eyes that he was scared, I think, that, you know, they were as far out as they were. Nobody willingly puts their child in danger. Their intention for that day was to have some fun on a paddleboard. I was trying to stay calm for Charlie, but inside, I, I was losing confidence. I really thought we were in trouble. On a camping trip near Margate, James, Sarah and their children had come to Kingsgate Bay earlier that day. We brought my wife's paddleboard with us. The sea was fairly calm. It was just seemed like a great opportunity to, uh, yeah, take it out. I don't normally go on the paddleboard with Dad because Dad, I don't think, is as confident as Mum at paddleboarding. I've got terrible balance. I'm not a very strong swimmer, so paddleboarding for me is way outside of my comfort zone. Despite James's lack of experience, he took his son Charlie out on their paddleboard to explore the neighbouring Joss Bay. Charlie was keen. It was a bit of an adventure for him. And he was smiling and happy, and James was relaxed, I think. So um, they had a good paddle across. But after some time in Joss Bay, James and Charlie became aware that the wind was picking up and decided to head back. We saw them traverse across quite a few times. They don't seem to be making much headway. That was when my sister-in-law, Hannah, had said to me, oh, do you think they're OK? The sea was uh, getting a bit rougher. The waves were a bit bigger, and it was harder and harder to keep our course. It was quite difficult to paddle. We were being tossed more sideways than forwards. Charlie really started to panic. He was saying, are we going to make it, Daddy? It was difficult to see my son so distressed. That was one of my biggest worries, that he would be really upset. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it only just comes out when you start to talk about it. Um, right. James and Charlie were soon being swept far out to sea. Growing increasingly concerned for their safety, Sarah called the Coast Guard on 999. I was a bit worried about how we were getting closer and closer to the cargo ship. I was worried that it was going to make big waves that would capsize us, because I really didn't want to be capsized. Time passed 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and I was, I guess, losing faith that we were going to be, be saved. There's something in the between them two boats. You see it? Yeah. Fortunately, both Pete and the lifeguard managed to spot James and Charlie, who were by now nearly two miles out to sea. I spotted the orange boat and I was just so relieved because I knew, I was like, we're going to be saved, finally. All our fears and worries just washed away and we were just so relieved and, and thankful that we were safe. Cold and exhausted, James and Charlie were returned to the beach they'd set off from over an hour earlier. It was sheer relief to see, to see that boat come back in. We managed to get them ashore. It was a lovely reunion back on the beach. There was like smiles and tears and hugging. It was a good sense of feeling that we picked these people up and took them back to their loved ones. My mum was just so happy. She was really relieved that we were OK. We're so happy to be reunited with Sarah. 
just realise it, it, yeah, it, it could have ended so differently for us. We have got a couple of people cut off by the tide just there. I think they're doing yoga. I look back on it with appreciation for the dedication and commitment of, of the teams, the volunteers. Unless there's any other tasking, we're going to head back to station. So the Coast Guard, Margot Oldby. If it wasn't for Pete's eagle eyes, it could have been could have been worse and could have been a much larger search. After this shout, it was definitely a feeling of, well, that was a that was a job well done. For generations, the RNLI was almost exclusively crewed by fishermen and seafarers. But now, the volunteers are from all walks of life, with one common purpose. <laughs> all right, all right. Come on in, chef. One scallops, one mackerel. We've got builders, doctors, a couple of people that are in the NHS. The uniqueness of having different characters on the crew Obviously, everyone bounces off each other, so, yeah, it's good. Look at that, he's a pro. <laughs> <laughs> we are a dysfunctional family. You, you know, there's not one person that I can't rely on for a bit of advice or a bit of help with some DIY, you know, away from the lifeboating stuff. You need to trust your crewmates. They're your right hand, women and men. Trust them with my life. I know they're going to keep me safe, and I know they'll bring me home. You could be a high power solicitor or a police inspector. It takes all sorts, you know, the old saying, butcher, baker, candlestick, baker. And I think that's what makes us unique. When we step up to go on a shout, we're all part of one team. And that's very important. Lying on the south coast of Wales, in the county of Bridgend, is the bustling seaside community of Porthcawl. Porthcawl is the perfect picture postcard a holiday town. It's a town with a bit of character, really. You've got sort of the, uh, the classic Welsh winter months, where it all goes a bit grey and dreary. Then in the summer, you've just got this fantastic seaside town. People come for fun and frolics, and uh, they have it in abundance here. But while the seas off Porth Call are undoubtedly alluring, to the unwary, they can also be treacherous. We're up inside the Bristol Channel, and there's not much land between where we are and South America. So you get large waves building throughout that whole stretch. They're quite a dangerous part of the coast as well. So we've got lots of hidden rocks, sandbanks, an extremely fast tide. There's places to get cut off. There's wind, there's waves. So we're, we're quite busy. There's been a lifeboat in Porth Call since 1860. Today, the station boasts a seagoing crew of 30 men and women. The Porth Call crew is quite an eclectic mix. It's like being a member of a football or rugby team. So there's different characters, but everyone's pulling in the same direction. We've got an eye surgeon, we've got personal trainers, gym owners, engineers, teachers, uh, programmers. Oh, yeah, so we've got Mark, who's, uh, who's a local, local vicar. It's not quite as exciting as putting a dry suit on. Alongside his job as a reverend at All Saints Church in the town. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Peace be with you. Mark has been a volunteer crew member at Porth Call for the past three years. Mark's a very interesting character. When I first met him down at Lifeboat Station, I thought he was taking the mick when he said he was a priest, because he doesn't quite fit your normal profile. One of the highlights of my year is the RNLI carol service. It's always standing room only. Um, we'll, we'll often get you know, the Land Rover or one of the boats outside if we can. He's a really nice chap, fun-loving, and um, probably not what you expect from your, your average uh, um, reverend, to be honest. Just fits in absolutely perfectly with the rest of us. Having a vicar on board the boat, I don't think the language changes. I think there's a little bit less blasphemy. Being a member of a lifeboat crew can expose people to extreme conditions and being a member of clergy means that even when I'm out at sea, I know that I can take something of that peace 
with me. I try to carry it, um, not exactly in my pocket, but wherever I am and wherever I'm going. So the only time I've been to Mark's church um, for a service was his wedding, and we didn't stay very long. A sunny but breezy Saturday afternoon in March. The majority of Porthcall's lifeboat crew are attending the marriage of Mark and his fiancée, Jessie. The plan for the day was quite simple, quite a simple wedding. We didn't want any real fuss. It was a relaxed day. I had no real plans for the morning. I had to be at the, uh, the church by 2 p.m. Arrived at the church. Gareth made me sit down the front next to him, which I'm always anxious about anyway. The wedding was conducted by a good friend of mine, and so he began um, thinking he was funny by saying that everybody should turn their phones off, unless, of course, uh, they're a member of the lifeboat crew and needed to keep it on just in case there was a shout. We sang the first song, felt a vibration in, in my pocket. I did see some of the other crew members um, fumble for their uh, pages, and they were doing exactly the same. I got an elbow in the ribs, and then we uh, quickly ushered ourselves out. Members of the National Coast Watch Institution have spotted something of concern on a notoriously dangerous beach five miles southeast of the town. The tide was coming in. Two people were just in the process of getting cut off. They were about to try and make their own way to the main part of the beach, which would take them across a very treacherous bit of water. Having rushed the half-mile journey from the church to the lifeboat station, Luke, Ken and Gareth are soon part of the crew readying the town's Atlantic-class inshore lifeboat for launch. It almost felt really surreal that one minute we were in a church, next minute we're, uh, we're afloat. When the tide cuts someone off, it is time-sensitive because you're not sure how uh, people are going to react in that situation. There's a risk they could end up in quite significant trouble. Just 20 minutes after the pages interrupted the wedding, the lifeboat crew arrive on scene. I think the helm saw two casualties. They were walking towards the area of the, of the cliff where the swell and waves were starting to hit. The seaside had changed. The waves had picked up and the sets were coming in probably uh, a lot more frequent than, uh, than we'd, we'd liked. At that point in time, the real concern was, could we really commit the boat in there to, to do that rescue? With the tide rising over 25 feet today, this narrow strip of beach will be almost completely submerged in an hour. And as the water level rises, it's creating increasingly large waves on the shore. Yeah, bad idea. Meaning the crew cannot risk taking the Atlantic in to recover the casualties. I remember the helm saying, right, who's swimming in? And we, we, we kind of all turned around and looked at Luke. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You've got a couple of big swells of roll. Wave on, hold on, boys. Okay, come on, Luke. Ready when you are, mate. I don't know, they always seem to pick me to be the one to jump in. Uh, I'll go out that side. It can be quite daunting to jump into the, into the swell and the waves. But there's a bit of adrenaline, and I quite enjoy it. Well, now? Go. This one. So it's very hard to swim in... Um, full lifeboat gear. So the only way you can really do it by swimming on your back. The waves come in that day were at times three to four metres. So uh, the Coast Guard had made the ultimate decision to say, OK, stand by, we're going to call the, uh, the helicopter and uh, they'll be probably with you within 15 minutes. Hey, guys! <laughs> when they saw me running towards them, um, I think they're a bit confused. Up to? Oh, we're getting on a boat to get you out. Hey, Gus. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, because you're, you're cut off now. Oh. There's a rip there, and I'll pull you out. Oh. Unaware of the danger they're in, the two casualties haven't noticed that they're now stranded with no means of escape. 
they were happy to see me, although slightly perturbed that they upset a wedding. One of the lifeboat people. Oh, no. But it's all right, it's before the sermon. <laughs> a greater concern now is that the tide is still surging in. The crew must get the two casualties off the beach before it disappears entirely. After a 10 mile journey from nearby St. Athen, the rescue helicopter arrives on scene. Our local Coast Guard helicopter isn't very far away, and they often struggle to perform winching operations due to how full of fuel they are by the time they've arrived on our patch. There was a rocky outcrop on the beach, which was suitable for landing the helicopter on, but it was a really impressive bit of flying to watch. The couple were slightly embarrassed to find themselves in that position. I think the helicopter being caught out was probably the most embarrassing of all. I think rather than swimming back out to the boat and uh, as, uh, rescuing Luke, he had the better option of going up in the helicopter and having a, a drier ride. Luke hitches a ride with the Coast Guard helicopter and escorts the two casualties to the safety of the cliff top above Dunraven Bay. Yeah, it was a very surreal day for me because I was at work in the morning. Got back quickly into smart gear, got to the wedding, then I was in a boat, helicopter, and standing in a field. While Luke heads straight back to the wedding, the rest of the Atlantic crew must first return to station before they too can rejoin the festivities. Myself and a, and a colleague walked, uh, walked up to the reception and uh, kind of joined the wedding party like we hadn't been away. We just, we just started where we left off. You know, this is just so typical. It doesn't matter if it's Christmas Day, Valentine's Day, or even a wedding. Whenever the shout comes in, lifeboat crew will respond. Over 160 miles away is the popular resort town of Blackpool. With a seven mile long beachfront, which attracts nearly 20 million visitors a year, this is the busiest lifeboat station in the northwest of England, with 113 shouts last year alone. Facing directly onto the wild waters of the Irish Sea, Blackpool's lifeboat crew must always be prepared to launch at a moment's notice. The best thing about being part of the crew at Blackpool is the team that you're with. Very much a tight-knit team. We all come down to train together, we all go out on jobs together, we all need to look after each other, and I think that's where the, the close bond comes into it. Just listen up a minute. Uh, the situation is that uh, we were alerted by one... You need to rely on that person next to you, and every role's important. We can't launch the boat without a Land Rover driver. Our launching authorities, again, we can't launch without them, so it's, it's really good to have a good, strong team. Right, Anthony, ready to go. As one of the key members of Blackpool's shore crew, Pat has been assisting the station's launches for just over a year now. He knows the dangers of this stretch of coast all too well. I come from a seafaring family in Fleetwood, I, which is 10 miles down the coast from Blackpool. My father was an engineer on the trawlers. He had connections with the lifeboat, as did his immediate family. Unfortunately, I never met him because uh, when my mother was two months pregnant with me, um, he was drowned at sea. I had every intention of actually joining the lifeboat crew when I was old enough, but uh, the career I pursued would, wouldn't permit that. For four decades, Pat served as a police officer in Blackpool. In 1983, he was on duty on what would become one of the town's darkest days. The weather was quite severe. There were mountainous seas. The sea temperature was between five and six degrees. It was shortly before two o'clock this afternoon when a man was taking his dog for a walk along this pathway behind me. The dog went into the sea, the man went after the dog, and some police officers came to help him. We take an oath of office in the police to protect life and property. It was an instant decision. Um, it was now or never to attempt a rescue. Alongside Pat, 
A number of other police officers were now on scene, including PCs Colin Morrison, Angela Bradley and Gordon Connolly. Angela handed the life belt to me. Waves were crashing over the top of the slipway and going over the top of us, not just spray, waves. Both Angela and Gordon held onto the rope. As I went in, I was engulfed by a wave and I went under. And when I came up, um, I saw the male pushed against the sea wall and both Angela and Gordon were in the sea without any buoyancy aids. All of us were being swamped. The RNLI didn't launch because the breaking waves were smashing up against the wall and they were against the wall. So it was very rough, uh, too rough and dangerous for the boats to try and attempt to rescue there. The police officers jumped into the icy water to try to reach Mr Alistair Anthony, but very quickly the police officers too found themselves in danger. Ropes and two life belts failed to save him as the waves lashed the sea wall. By that stage, I was weakening. I could hear people shouting, but I felt like they were a quarter of a mile away and they were moving in slow motion. And I knew um, I was in the process of drowning. I just had a sensation of being pulled and the last recollection I had was my head hitting the sea wall. Two other policemen were rescued. One is seriously ill in the intensive care unit of a local hospital. The other is in hospital too, but is less seriously ill. A huge search operation to find the missing was called off late this afternoon when the weather became too... My next memory really was waking up in the intensive care at Blackpool Victoria Hospital. The first question I asked was Angela and Gordon and Colin. But tonight, all hope for those still missing, including a policewoman, virtually disappeared. They said, no, they've come. We worked together, we socialised together, we were like a family, so it was devastating. Angela Bradley was a single officer. Gordon Conley had recently got married, and Colin had four young children and a wife. Amazingly brave. I couldn't see myself doing that. I couldn't see myself uh, plucking up the courage to, to go into it just in my clothes with a life ring. Pat is a local hero, especially to Blackpool. Yeah, definitely. There was a massive outpouring uh, of sympathy in the town. We have a memorial service on the 5th of January every year. 2023 was the 40th anniversary. This year there was over 250 officers and the significant members of the public, along with my colleagues from the lifeboat. I think it made you closer to the people you work with. Um, and it, it made you respect, um, how can I say, re respect life in a way, uh, to realise how precious life is. The end of May bank holiday weekend. As evening draws in, the wind is picking up. I was at home playing with my two dogs in the back garden. It had been a lovely day, um, so I was half expecting something to something to happen for the pager to sound, um, and there it did. People on the promenade have spotted someone in trouble in the sea near Blackpool Pier. Having called 999, they're now filming on their phones as events unfold. He's, he's got his hands up. Look, he's you can got see his hands up. You can see him. I was actually at the lifeboat station when the pager went off a short time before 7 p.m. in the evening. We started getting the information that it was a person in the water drifting out to sea directly opposite the station between Central and North Pier. You can see him there on the camera. The tide was ebbing. There was an easterly wind blowing towards the sea. It makes it very difficult for somebody, once they're out of the depth, uh, to actually self-recover. Thank you, mate. Really, speed is the essence. Ultimately, the longer we take to get there, the more tired they're going to be, and ultimately, they can, they can drown. Now almost 500 metres out, 
The casualty is struggling to stay afloat and being taken further out by the rip current every minute. I could see that the casualty was being swamped a little bit by the wave action and, and the person's head was going underwater and then bobbing up again. I can't see him anymore, can you? I can't. We know that there is that chance that they will disappear under the water and we won't get them. And we end up then searching for that person and you're not always successful. Yeah, keep eyes on. When you can only see a head in the water, they are low down in the water, which normally indicates you know, they're, they're tired, they're exhausted. The next natural step from that is the body just sinking and the head disappears. Jumpy Johnny, jumpy Kyle. Right. Watch your feet. The adrenaline's rushing at that point because ultimately we don't know how long the casualty's been in the water. Um, and the top of our priority list is just to get there as quick as we can, so there's a big sense of urgency. Fair play to the boys there. You're getting thick, in it? I'd say casualty was about five to 600 metres from the water's edge out to sea. Starboard side, pick up! They were quite a distance out. We were going for quite a bit at full speed to get to them. It took us about 30 seconds in all to get to the casualty. Knowing that the casualties in the water and they've been in the water for, for a prolonged period of time, 30 seconds can feel quite a long time to get to them. Starboard side. The casualty was very tired, very lethargic. Um, you could see that the casualty was had been there a while, really cold and just struggling. You're always concerned for hypothermia, although the temperature of the water might seem warm, especially when it's shallow. As you go deeper out to sea, the water is very cold. Knowing past experiences and knowing Blackpool and how dangerous the tide can be, once we've got the casualty on board, knowing that they're conscious and breathing and they're going to be safe is a big sense of relief all around. You all right? It could have been a totally different outcome. Um, another five, ten minutes, the casualty could have been suffering from exhaustion and ultimately it could have been a completely different, different story. OK, jump out. I felt super alone. I felt like nobody was coming. I felt like this was just going to be it. I thought I was just going to keep going, keep going, and I was just going to get stranded in the middle of the ocean. And it was very scary to know that I might die in front of all these people and none of them know I'm here. 17-year-old Riley had travelled down from neighbouring Fleetwood with a friend for a day on Blackpool Beach. Once or twice a month, we go in the sea together. The beach wasn't too busy at the time that we went in, but it was about four or five o'clock. The waves were a little bit rough, closer to the shore, but you could see further out they were a lot calmer. So I thought if we just go in a little bit further, we'd be okay. And we stood there together and I have asthma, so I was starting to get a little bit out of breath. So I just took a minute just to catch my breath. About two waves came between us. And at that point, I realised I couldn't touch the floor. But my friend says, do you want me to get any help or anything? I says, no, I'll be OK. I just need to catch my breath. And they said, you're getting pulled out. I says, no, you're having a joke. I says, you're stepping back. And he says, no, no, I'm not. On an outgoing tide, strong rip currents can form in the deep channels in between the sandbanks off Blackpool Beach. I was swimming and swimming. I felt like I wasn't even getting anywhere. So that's why I said, go and get some help. Riley's friend managed to make it ashore and raise the alarm. Within minutes, police and lifeboat crews were rushing to the water's edge. I could feel the water underneath from my hips downwards was very cold. It was ice cold, but the water on the top half of my body was nice and warm from the sun. And I could tell that that cold water was what was pulling me out. 
It's my friend. Yeah, um, yeah. like a blue see-through shirt with a pink bar underneath and like grey shorts. I felt kind of helpless because I could see my friend at shore and I could see briefly that they were trying to talk to somebody. I couldn't see anybody looking at me, so I started to cry because I was panicking. I thought, maybe nobody's listening. I was very scared. I was shouting, help me, and nobody could hear me. I couldn't keep myself up. I was shivering, and I started to struggle to keep my head above the water, and I started to struggle to kick my legs. It crossed my mind that I might not make it back to shore alive. And that's when I started to lose hope, as there was still no sign of anybody. I can't see him anymore, can you? I saw a lot of lights and sirens along the seafront, and I thought, they're going to come and help me. When I saw the lifeboat coming into the water, I felt a sense of relief. And I tried to keep myself above, but I noticed my legs just weren't listening to my brain anymore. My legs weren't moving. I saw the lifeboat dispatched into the water, but then I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember it coming to me. I don't remember being pulled out of the water. <laughs> but I do remember once I was on the lifeboat, as it felt like I just became conscious again. It's almost like I jumped back into my own body. You all right? I just felt safe. I knew that the crew were going to take care of me. I just knew that everything was going to be OK. And my friend was telling me that I'm getting pulled. Further out. I said, I said you're pulling my leg, you're going backwards. Yeah, yeah. And then they kept saying, do you want to help us? I said, no more, I just need to catch my breath. Yeah. And then I kept swallowing water. Well, you did the right thing, just stay in the yeah. block, didn't you? Yeah. You did well to me on. So after a shout, with such a positive outcome, it's a really good feeling, knowing that you've been there and you've been able to help someone. Um, there's no other feeling like it, really. Oh, you're going to go through. Yeah. Winner. It's a good feeling knowing that the casualty is going to go back to their family. You don't want any family to have to deal with that trauma of losing a loved one. So, yeah, it's, it is it's a good feeling knowing that you've prevented them having to do that. Riley was taken to hospital by paramedics from the Northwest Ambulance Service to be checked over and was discharged later that day. I'm so thankful that the RNLI were there when they were. I think, would it have been five more minutes later, I might not be here today telling my story. So I owe them everything. I live in awe of the crews, the risks they take, reflecting on my past. It gives me great gratitude to see our professional crew recover somebody successfully um, and save their lives. A hundred and fifty three miles northeast in Scotland is the small harbour town of Dunbar. Dunbar is a nice place to live. Those are kind of classic fishing town as grew massively in the last few years, but there's still a community feel to it. I think the nicest thing is, it is the area itself. We're really lucky that it's quite a, a nice sunny place. It's widely known as Sunny Dunny, the sunniest place in Scotland. It maybe gets more sunshine than everywhere else, but it doesn't mean that it's not sometimes raining at the same time. So the coastline in Dunbar is variable, and that's one of the things that we we love about the coast here. You've got beautiful stretches of beach, uh, Dunbar, Belhaven Bay, and White Sands. And there's also some pretty spectacular coastal paths and rock formations. Especially if you're into walking or have a dog, it's great to get out and about. Dunbar has had a lifeboat station since 1808. Today's crew includes 10 with over 20 years service under their belt. I've been on the Dunbar Lifeboat crew, I think it's 17 years now. I'm currently the longest serving female at Dunbar Lifeboat crew. It does have quite a family feel to it and everybody can bring their own strengths to the job. Laura and one of the helms, Gordon, take the station's family feel to another level. Gordon's my husband, I met him years ago. Bit of a cliche, met at work night out. I think most of the time we make it work. 
we don't argue too much when we're both on a boat together. I think we're quite lucky to be on the lifeboat together. We know what each person's doing in the background. But it's going to crash. That's going to happen. <laughs> a lot of families that don't get to see the, the sharp end. We can go home, we can discuss a job without having to explain every detail because we understand the situations we might have faced. I don't really think we're different from other couples. Most people have something to do together. It just turns out that ours is that we spend our time saving lives at sea. Early November, a fresh afternoon. The Coast Guard has received a 999 call from Raven's Hugh Beach, nearly four miles northwest of the lifeboat station. <laughs> Laura and I were at home. After many years, you learn to take everything with you and make sure you don't need the bathroom. There might be some nerves there, and there, there's some adrenaline kicking in as well. You're just eager to make sure that the boat's ready and that you can get out onto the water as soon as possible. The information we got was that somebody was on a local beach and that their dog had swam out to sea. Within minutes, Dunbar's D-Class inshore lifeboat is on the water. There is always a bit of a, a time pressure to get there as quickly as possible. The owners start to panic, obviously it's their beloved pet. They can then take risks themselves. It has happened before and people have sadly lost their lives. With light southerly winds and calm seas, the D-Class crew rushed to the dog's last reported position at top speed. We were heading for Ravenshoe Beach. It is quite a popular place. It's a nice area to go for a dog walk. What's that ETA? Oh, okay. While Ravenshoe is ideal for a wintry beach walk, the seas offshore are less forgiving. The water temperature around that time of year is about six degrees. It can give you a false impression when the sun's out and you think it's actually quite a warm winter's afternoon. Just over 10 minutes after launching, the crew arrive at the spot where the dog was reported to have swum out to sea. The crew are informed over the radio that a mobile Coast Guard unit is on the beach to assist and may have sighted the dog. It's very difficult to spot a black dog in those kinds of conditions. Black dog, losing light, rising tide, it was a, it was a difficult mix. Oh, there's D400 yards in front of you. There's just a little... Oh, you see it? There it is. I think it was Duncan that, that pointed out from the front of the boat. He could see what he thought was their dog. Guys, how are you going? Hi. I made sure that I kept a visual contact. Hi, right, guys, on here. You guys on? Yeah. The dog is approximately 200 metres out on a small group of rocks. Its concerned owner is on the shore. Gordon was able to pick his way in between some of the outcrops of rocks and move as close as we could safely. The crew may have found the dog, but they can't be certain what kind of reception he'll give them. He wouldn't know who we were. We were dressed funny, there's a big orange boat coming towards him. So I asked Dunbar Coast Guard, who were with his owner, what his name was, thinking if we were able to use his name, it might be more reassuring. Uh, the dog is called Fergus. Did they get that? It's called Fergus. 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 Down below me here. Yeah. Right. It's important to find out the dog's name because as you're approaching, if it is nervous, then that's something that it's going to be familiar with. Some kind of when you get out. We had to manoeuvre the boat into a place where we think we could get near to Fergus. It wasn't a place where I thought initially we could get right to him. So we asked Duncan to make his way towards Fergus at that point. Here we go, boy. Here we are. Although he was barking, the main emotion that I was feeling was just concern for the dog. He seemed in distress 
and um, we wanted to bring him some kind of comfort and bring him back to safety. So, all right, boy. Here we are. Here we are. Fergus. Fergus. Here, boy. You've got to try and stay calm, and hopefully the dog will sense yeah. that. You're just trying to be a calming presence and trying to reassure the casualty, in this case, is the dog, and trying to make sure that they, they, they know that you're there to help. Here we go. That's it. All right. So when you're dealing with dogs, it's really important to try to get some trust. Okay, now. Just to, to soothe them and to hopefully make sure they don't do anything erratic. OK, now. I think Duncan reacted really well. He was trying to talk to Fergus, like, reassuringly. Fergus. Hello, boy. Hello, boy. That's it. Fergus was it. happy enough by that time. I think he'd been reassured. He seemed more relaxed. You're OK now. Duncan is now known as the dog whisperer. That's it. He was able to You're get him from barking to being a lot more calm and like allowing us to help him. Good boy. So once we had him out of harm's way and into the boat, I was a bit happier that at least then we, we had a control of where it was. 20 minutes after they launched, the Dunbar crew are able to return Fergus to his owner on shore. Once he was on the beach and I think realised he had his feet on dry land again, <laughs> he then had a big shake, flew all the water off, and then trotted about round his owner like nothing had happened. I mean, I'll never forget the day. It, it just, it was just such a horrible, horrible experience, and I thought it was going to end so differently. I thought it was going to have a tragic ending. Janie had come to the area for a holiday with her husband and their two dogs, Woody and Fergus, a flat coat retriever. We had friends coming down um, to join us and were heading out with the dogs onto the beach for a walk. It was a lovely beach, beautiful sand, went for miles, quite a few sort of rocky areas, but lovely to walk on and very, very few people on it. Fergus was only three at the time. There's a saying about flat coats that there's the Peter Pan of the gun dog world that they never really grow up. <laughs> and he was very much still a puppy, full of fun. And he encountered this bird. A seabird had caught Fergus's attention. Intrigued, he followed it into the sea. They just started to go further and further out. And I still wasn't really panicking, because I thought, any minute now, he's going to come back. And he just kept on going. And he went and went and went. And that was when I started to panic. Strong currents and an offshore wind meant that Fergus was soon being swept out. They would kind of disappear into the water and then you would see them again and they'd be a bit further out. Within minutes, Janie had lost sight of Fergus altogether. I was in tears by then because I thought, you know, I've, I've lost the dog. There's a bit of you, you just want to try and go in after him, but I mean, I knew I couldn't do that. I, I was totally heartbroken. It was a horrible feeling. My friend said, why don't we phone the Coast Guards? Alongside the lifeboat, a Coast Guard team was also sent to the beach to try and sight Fergus in the seas offshore. My friend, she shouted to me, I think I can see a dog on a rock. All right, guys, on here. Yeah. yeah. Having confirmed that this was an exhausted-looking Fergus, the Coast Guard team was able to guide the Dunbar crew to his location. The lifeboat then arrived, and I was so relieved to see them. I mean, I was so grateful. Good boy. Good boy. Dad. Good boy. Honestly, I'd gone from the depths of despair to 
just, yeah, couldn't believe that that was him on this boat. Within 45 minutes of calling the Coast Guard, Janie was reunited with Fergus on the beach. He just shook himself and looked at me as if to say, so where, where, where are we going now? You wouldn't have known anything had happened. He was totally nonplussed by this whole situation. Uh, it's quite funny. At four o'clock, an hour and a quarter after being paged, the Dunbar crew returned to station. Animals are always good. Yeah. Especially if they're nice. Yeah. <laughs> but then you just never quite know what they're going to be like, though, eh? I was proud of myself, yeah. I think the training that we'd, uh, we'd undergone had come into play. It felt fantastic to have been a part of saving a life. I love that it was uh, Fergus, the dog, and great outcome. We got feedback from his owner that evening that he'd had a good dinner and was chilling out in front of the fire. Definitely felt really relieved that he was, he was doing well, and it makes you quite happy to know that we made a difference to him that day. Without them, we probably wouldn't have our dog. And fortunately, it was a happy ending. Although Janie and her husband still go for walks on the beaches around Dunbar, these days, they only have one dog by their side. Unfortunately, we no longer have Fergus. He had a heart problem and passed away last autumn. He was so special. There was just something about him. He just had a real character. Yeah. We're thinking of getting another puppy, and it'll be a flat goat. <laughs> Although James and his son Charlie still like visiting the seaside with their family, their paddleboard doesn't always come with them. This incident has changed my outlook, not to be so blasé. I'm happy to say that Charlie has been out on the sea again. The one thing it probably has deterred him from is going out on a paddleboard with me. And just three months after being dragged out to sea by a rip current off Blackpool Beach, Riley hasn't yet found the confidence to go back in the water. I'm still getting over everything that happened, even now. I look out to the water and it, it's peaceful. As calm as it looks on the surface, there's a lot going on underneath that you can't see. I hope I'll never need rescuing again, but I do know that if I ever do need rescuing again, they'll always be there. I'm not sure how long people would be able to cope with that temperatures, but it wouldn't be a long time. Even though we're trained, it takes guts of one of our crew members to actually do that. Just hold on, Shane. Just hold on, for God's sake. It was just lifting up, bang, up, down, bang. It's a noise that I'll not forget. <laughs> <laughs>